forward to the computer and we're gonna go live on Facebook. Sorry. Okay, Ray, we're nearly there. Okay. Okay, can you see us going live? You on Facebook? Uh, no. Okay. Because we are live on Facebook. Mm. Just want to give a couple of minutes for people to join because we're a little okay. bit early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can also share the, the page to any groups or to your own page. We're just sorting out the technical stuff and we will be with you shortly. I'm just sharing it, Ray. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. It is now 7 p.m. Good afternoon and good evening and hello if you're joining us from another part of the world. Uh, this is Nishani Ford and again on a great series of um, Seeds of Hope. I'm uh, absolutely thrilled this evening to have with us Ray. Um, and Ray is uh, joining us for a very interesting uh, conversation. We're going to talk about nature deficit disorder. Um, and just by way of introduction, Ray is the former managing director of Msinzi uh, Resorts and Game Reserves. Prior to that, he's, he's lectured at UKZN. He's also served on the editorial board of Wild Magazine, a passionate nature conservationist whose mission is to encourage people to reconnect with nature. Welcome, Ray. Good evening, Shani, and uh, to everybody that's uh, viewing. Uh, and, uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Great, thanks, Ray. It's very exciting. So tell us, um, let's, let's start chatting. Tell us a little bit about who Ray is. You seem to have been lecturing. You've got an academic side and a nature conservation side, which makes it quite interesting. 
So tell us a little bit yeah. about <clears throat> Yeah, I think uh, I've had a, a very varied uh, career, uh, starting off uh, as a teacher. And then um, I taught at um, the then University of Dublin West, which became UKZN. Yeah. Um, I taught economics there, and then I was in the business school as well. But I had a, a very strong research interest in, uh, in environmental economics, yeah. which I then specialized in. And uh, from there, it led me into the field of, uh, of, of ecotourism, especially uh, regarding uh, community-based ecotourism and ecotourism as a tool for development. Okay. And at that time, <clears throat> that was in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were a lot of uh, land claims where previous um, game reserves were then being handed over to, to communities to, you know, as part of the land yeah. restitution process. And so we were involved a lot with KZ and Wildlife at that time to assist communities, you know, in, in managing or, or co-managing some of the, the, the reserves and, and the ecotourism facilities. Yeah. Uh, so we spent a lot of time up in, up in uh, Cozy Bay, Rocktail Bay area, uh, in Dumo, uh, you know, working there with communities. And then from that, <clears throat> I was offered a position at Dunsinzi uh, Resorts and Games, yes. uh, Good Tourism Division, uh, which I then accepted. Now, Dunsinzi is a, is a subsidiary of, uh, of Amgeni Water, which is the largest uh, water utility in KCN. And what Dunsinzi does, it basically manages the biodiversity around the dams and the catchment areas of the Amgeni. Mm -hmm the other rivers that feed into the dam. So <clears throat> we were involved with that. So a lot of the work involved ecosystem management and there were game reserves which we managed and there was also tourism facilities uh, that, that we managed. And uh, <clears throat> then after a few years working in the, in the ecotourism division, I was offered the position of B, which I then took over. Uh, and uh, I then ran the company for, for three and a half years until my contract came to an end, I think about three years ago. Yeah. And I decided then <clears throat> that I think it's time that I uh, basically try to do things that I always wanted to do. I wanted to do some traveling, do some writing and things like that. So then I basically left him since he, I've been sort of doing stuff on my own, you know, uh, ever since uh, then. And uh, yeah, so, so that's basically, you know, uh, my sort of work experience maybe what qualifies me to be a guest on, on your show to uh, talk about a, a, a topic uh, you know, regarding nature. So, yeah, well, I've got, and I also got two kids, uh, well, well, they've grown up. Uh, yeah. My daughter's in yeah. Australia, and then my, my son's living here in Durban. He's a pilot, so, and I live in, in Durban, in Yellowwood Park. It's a nice leafy su suburb, you know, with tall yellowwood trees and borders the same bank nature itself, so it's still, and part of, 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 of nature, you know, I'm not sort of divorced from that. Yeah. Ray, I wonder if you could, if you could speak directly into your speaker. We seem to be like, you know, dipping in and out, and I don't want to miss it. Okay. Can I come closer, maybe? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Right, okay. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So before, I mean, that's, that's quite, a, quite an extensive kind of career and different things. But before you start chatting to us about, NDD and, and what that means. What does biodiversity mean? I mean, we hear this word so much. In a nutshell, to a layman, to somebody who's just picking, picking up these conversations, <clears throat> what does biodiversity mean? Well, well, bio, bio basically is life, a okay? Greek, Greek word for life. Diversity is a diverse form of life. Yes. Biodiversity is a diverse forms of life that make up an ecosystem. An ecosystem basically is uh, you know, a combination of living and non-living organisms, you know, uh, living together in a community. Okay. So, uh, like a game reserve would be an ecosystem, you know, living organisms would be the animals and the plants, non-living would be the, the soil, the air, the water. Mm. So, biodiversity would be the diverse range of plants and life, basically, animals and things like that. Great, great. Bi Thank you. Is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, that, that explains it. So um, we spoke about something called nature deficit disorder or NDD. What is it? What is NDD? Um, yeah, nature 
Well, if you, if you look at the three, the three words that make up the term, nature, deficit, and disorder. So it's nature, deficit is a shortage, basically. And, yeah. and, and so there's a shortage of nature, basically, and leads to a, basically a disorder in our lives. That, that term was first coined by a guy called Richard Lowe yeah. in around 2005 in a book uh, called The Last Child in the Womb. Mm. And what, what Lowe uh, basically discovered that, uh, you know, especially uh, younger uh, children okay, uh, are becoming increasingly disconnected the natural world, okay? And <clears throat> that disconnect leading to certain um, disorders or certain problems, okay, yeah. in now well-being, okay? Um, <clears throat> the theory is that, I mean, human beings for what, two million years or so that we've been on this planet, okay, always lived and been part of nature. It's only in the very recent of our history have we, become more urbanized and started living in, in enclosed environments like we do now. But the body remembers, you know, uh, the body remembers where we came from and it yeah. still yearns and still longs, you know, for that original garden of Eden that we can say, you know, that, that we came from. Yeah. And, you know, it's part of what uh, Carl Jung, you know, Sackle talked about the collective unconscious, you know, oh. means as a race, as a human race, you know, there is a collective, collectively and unconsciously we remember what it was like to be, you know, in nature. And <clears throat> because our bodies remember it, and because we, we alienate ourselves from nature, that does result in some sort of, you know, effects on our well-being, okay? Yeah. And those well-being can range from psychological well-being, okay? Uh, inside, okay, uh, with children, short attention, like that. Yeah. Then they are physiological. You know, uh, effects of, of as well. That we were meant to be out there hunting and doing whatever. Because now we are we are stuck inside. Okay, so we don't get that exercise that we used to used to get. So there are physiological you know impacts of that. Yeah. It's also cognitive, you know, in the way we think as well. You know, um, yeah. it affects our our ability to think creatively. Okay. So this is the generic term that Low basically coined. And 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 to put it in a nutshell. What he's saying is that human beings are part of nature. What we are living in now, in, in this mostly indoor environment, okay, yeah. is unnatural to our, to our, to our, our being. And because of that, alienation okay, leads to these sort of, uh, you know. So that's in a nutshell, I think, what, what he's trying to say and what causes this, okay. Because if we look at an average day, you know, in, in anyone's life, up in the morning, you know, we shower, we get into our car, go to work, uh, you know, we come back and we're back in the house. We spend very little time, you know, outdoors. Most of our life is spent indoors, if you really think about it. Yeah. Most of that time is actually spent looking at some sort of screen, you know, it's either your, your tablets or your phone or your computer screen, okay? It doesn't give you much time, you know, to look out into the natural world. So these are some of the, I think, the, the, the causes of, of NDT that we, uh, our, our current lifestyle is such that it leaves very little time for us, you know, to spend time in, in nature. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. I mean, uh, just working at home now, one of the challenges is that sometimes you, you get up and you, you're in front of your, your screen and you actually forget to take a break to go outside or to get some sunshine. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you've spoken to us very extensively about what makes connecting to nature very important. But, you know, one of the things that I want to, to kind of maybe just labor on is the impact on the mental health of a person, especially mm. during this pandemic. We've seen an increase in, um, in mental health illnesses. And do you think that there's a direct correlation between the lack of connecting with nature? Possibly? Yeah, because, you, you know, um, especially during lockdown, I think it was, I mean, uh, it was, I think, worse uh, during, during lockdown where, you know, we, we, we were not allowed to, especially in the earlier stages of lockdown, yes. you know, we yes. didn't leave. I mean, I, I was, 
you know, in, in, in a terrible state because I couldn't even leave the front yard, you know, so I used to walk in the garden and, and you, know, uh, you know, get as much contact with nature. Through. But I think what, what COVID has shown us, I think there's two things about nature COVID has shown us. One, that I think has heightened the impact, basically, of a lack of nature on mental health. And I mean, we've seen anecdotal evidence of, uh, of, this, of this mental illness, I think, during this period, okay, increased violence and, you know, all, all kinds of things that, that is happening. I think the other, the other aspect regarding uh, COVID and uh, nature is, in, in a way, at least, at least the COVID gave uh, nature a little bit of a break. Because, you know, you, you must have seen, uh, you know, videos of, of, of canals in Venice where fish and dolphins are coming where they never were before. Yes. So, you know, because there were not impacts of, I mean, high impacts of, of tourism and things like that there, give nature some sort of uh, a breathing space, you know, to heal and to recover in certain, yes. in, in, in certain cases. Okay. So from that point of view, I think, you know, uh, you, that, that that was one of the the positives, let's say, that that came out of this year, but of course, it did take its no long, its its toll on uh, you know on, on on mental health, and I think people who are cooped up inside yeah. finally begin to realize you know just how important it is to be outside. Yeah, yeah, and you know we also have parents um, who are homeschooling at this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a lot of I mean one of the things you said is that you know we we stand a risk of the younger generation not not enjoying nature and not taking care mm -hmm. of our world as much as we we should. So you know being a, a sort of a, having an educational background, understanding mm -hmm. the the dynamics of what parents might be going through with homeschooling. What are some of the like you know practical things that uh, parents can do to teach children about? nature and about learning in nature yeah um you know when i was in high school there was a poem that we learned by william wordsworth it was called up up my friend i think and it yeah. basically is up up my friend and quit your books why all this uh maybe which is up up my friend and quit your tablets or your or your, or your, or your computers these days but Basically, you know, uh, in the end, Wordsworth says, let nature be thy teacher. Because, you know, uh, there's so much we can, we can learn from, from nature. And I've got a little nephew, he's nine years old. Yeah. And he comes and visits me quite often. And we spend a lot of time, he loves nature, so we spend a lot of time outdoors. You know? mm. And one day we're watching this, uh, let's give you an example, uh, you know, of, of how we, we could use nature in terms of teaching. Once we were looking at this um, flower, there was a bee, you know. Yeah. So we looked at it and then I was explaining to him, you know, the relationship between the bee and the flower, you know, that the bee needs the flower, the nectar, the flower needs the bee for pollination. So that is called in nature or in, in biology, we call that a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Symbiotic relationship is based on mutualism. That means both parties benefit from that relationship. Okay. And you'll find that nature is characterized by symbiosis, you know, everywhere, you know, there's... Yeah. So the opposite to symbiosis would be a parasitic relationship. So yes. the one party basically gains at the expense of the other. Yes. And I was talking to him about then about relationships among his friends and things like that. I said, isn't that a relationship you need to have? But rather a symbiotic relationship rather than a parasitic think, relationship. Yes. Because, I mean, we are, as human beings, we gregarious animals, you know, we need to interact with other human beings. That's the nature, basically, yes. of relationship have, you know, a mutual, uh, based on mutualism, based on, on symbiosis. Yes. Uh, you, could, you could understand it very, very, very uh, you know, easily because of the analogy of the bee and the flower, you know, that, uh, uh, just one example of how you could use, um, you know, an example from nature to teach some of, uh, you know, my Life values. Lessons. Yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, Nishani, I, I, I think is that if every child keep a little notebook called a nature journal, right? And <clears throat> a nature journal doesn't have to be something fancy. It could just be any, you know, cheap notebook you buy, you know, and 
what you do there is, is that you spend time outside in nature, but you begin to observe, you know, and when you observe, okay, you start to either draw something that you see, or you start writing something that you see there. Yeah. But that nature journal is your own journal, okay? You write, whatever you write there is not for any teacher to be marking or anything like that. So you could write with complete freedom whatever you want to write, however you want to write. Mm. That's the basis of creative writing, you know, being able to suck that inner critic in, in you and let your writing flow, okay? So keeping a nature journal, you know, encourages people to do some writing. It can encourage you to draw, okay? So it brings out that creative aspect in, in you, okay? And, and, and also what it does is that because you are drawing and because you are writing, you have to be more aware of what you are seeing. So the flower just doesn't become just a flower there. You look at every detail of the flower. You become aware of the pollens, the petals and things like that. Mm. And it has much more meaning when you're able to look at it with that type of attention, you see, yes. because the way we look at things now is that we just walk past it. You just see it as a flower, it's a flower. Yeah. Understand? But when you take the time to really look and to become aware of what you're, what you're seeing, okay, it, does, it becomes much more meaningful. So I think keeping a nature journal, I think, is, 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 is so, it's so useful, I think, to, to keep it in so many ways. And you can use it for whatever you want. I mean, even for biology lessons. You know, we used to draw flowers and earthworms and locusts in, in yes. biology lessons, drawing from textbooks. You know, now you can actually draw it from, 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 from real life, go outside and really look at it. Yeah. And, you know, so those are some of the things I think is very good. Yeah. If I can just ask you to come again closer to the, to the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, tell me, you know, with our political landscape changing, mm -hmm. you know, much has changed in this last, uh, last two weeks, uh, last week, in fact. Um, you know, how is that going to impact, do you believe, on, on looking after our earth? You know, what are some of the things we need to be aware of? Well, I think the biggest uh, news on the political front, I mean, we all know about the American elections. And uh, I think we all have a stake in that election. It may be an American election, but, you know, America is such a big player in the world that whatever happens in America affects the whole yes. world. And for me particularly, why uh, a Biden presidency was so important was the... Uh, what I think Trump did in, in terms of environmental regulations. Obama had done <clears throat> quite a bit in terms of, uh, you know, enacting legislating, legislation to protect the environment. Yeah. And then also Obama was one of the signatories of the Paris Agreement, you know, uh, about four years ago. Uh, but basically, Paris Agreement was almost every country in the world signed it. And uh, with a commitment to reduce greenhouse gases by at least 2% you know, in the next hundred years, try to yeah. global thing down. But one of the first things Trump did when he took office was to pull America out of that, out of that agreement. Now, you know, it could be, it's everyone's environment, you know, it's, and America uh, is, is one of the biggest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. So if America pulls out of that, it's, 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 it's a big thing. Yeah. So, and I was so encouraged to see that Biden says that one of the first thing he's going to do when he takes office in January is to take America back to the Paris uh, you know, agreement and, and then reenact some of the environmental laws and legislation that, that, that Trump held. So, um, you know, I think it bodes well for us from that point of view, you know, yeah. that a Biden presidency, okay, is good for the environment, okay? So I think those those are some of the the political uh, I think um, you know uh, things that happen in the political front. I think that is a, is a positive uh, you know for us as far as environmental matters are concerned. Yeah, and and I mean, is South Africa lagging behind, or are we part of this? No, I I think I think South Africa has got fairly good I think environmental legislation, conservation uh, you know legislation. Um, I don't think we are lagging behind. Maybe in, sometimes in enforcement of that, there maybe there's a couple of issues. But I don't think we, we, we I think we are up there, uh, you know, with, with the others in terms of our environmental regulation. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
You know, you speak about learning and teaching through nature, especially with your mm. nephew's example. What have been some of the key lessons that you've learned in nature in your own personal life um, that, uh, that's been, you know, instrumental in, in molding you into who you are? You know, maybe tell um, us a little bit of a personal story. Yeah, I mean, there are so many really, uh, you know, but there are one or two things that, um, uh, that, that stand out. And I think the, the one that I want to talk about is something that happened uh, very early on, I think, you know, at my first year at university. And maybe that was a watershed uh, moment in my life or incident in my life because it did shape you know, my thinking. Um, I was chosen to attend the Wilderness Leadership School uh, trail in Amphalosi Game Reserve. It's still run up to, up to today. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a seven-day uh, trail in the Amphalosi Game Reserve uh, where you, you know, you, you basically sleep on and you hike uh, along the Amphalosi River. And then, I mean, there's, there's wild animals uh, yes. everywhere. But it's the closest you can ever get to nature, you know, experience. And I, I was fortunate to have, uh, have, have gone on that trail. And, uh, you know, it, when, when I came back, it really changed. I think it changed who I was as person and I think um, you know this zeal that I feel for the environment and for protection I think that you know stems back right from that uh, from that moment and yeah. the whole purpose of the wilderness leadership school and the and the trails basically is started by Ian Player you know started by Ian Player and um, and strange enough Ian Player also started in Cinzi the company that I managed you know yeah uh, so uh, and the, the whole aim of the Wilderness Leadership School was to take young people in wilderness experience so that they can then share that, you know, oh. with, uh, with others. And when I did speak with Dr. Player a couple of years later when I was managing him since, you know, and I had to tell him, you know, Dr. Player, you know, I'm one of your success stories because I was one of those people that attended your Wilderness Leadership School and now come full circle 20 yeah. some odd years later managing a company that you know, you yourself start. So yeah. I think it was like almost a full circle for me yeah. uh, being head of Msinzi. Two organizations started by Ian Blair, you know, the Wilderness Leadership School and Msinzi. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was almost, I came, came full circle. So that experience of, of, of having spent that week in the Amphalosi, always, it's an indelible memory in my, in my mind. Yeah. I get it, yeah. Yeah. And what are some of the leadership lessons that you took out of that, that you were able to carry? Um, you know, if you look at nature, nature has no boundaries. Yeah. When I say people nature, there's no boundaries in nature. There are lines. Boundaries are man-made. Okay. They're, you know, when astronauts go up in space, they tell you when they look at the Earth, they don't see any... A map any uh, you know markings demarcating countries they just see yeah. continents yeah so when i say nature has no boundaries okay uh, is that everything is connected okay everything is connected right and when you when when, when you manage when you look at an organization company okay it's like an ecosystem just as a, as, a, as a natural ecosystem has got different, you know, components to it, you know, so does a company. Yeah. And the, the whole objective of, of an eco, natural ecosystem is harmony. It's a well balance between the various elements of an ecosystem. So you get the plants, you get the animals, you get the water, you get the soil. There's a perfect harmony and perfect balance. Yeah. When we manage, when we manage ecosystems, that is what we aim for. We aim for that harmony. Okay? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, and isn't that what an organization is? You know, the lessons you learn from the way you manage nature. Yeah. Because we call we call an, 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 a company an, org an organization. You know, it's an organism you know, different from an ecosystem. I see the word ecosystem is increasingly being used now in the corporate world. I see a lot of people are talking about this ecosystem and, and, and that ecosystem. And I like that because an ecosystem is an integrated whole okay? yeah and actually yeah. too often in companies you find that there's a lot of disintegration in companies you know so-called silo each yeah. one operating independently and you cannot 
cannot achieve that harmony that I'm talking about if each one is operating independently. So if you look at, if you ask in terms of leadership lessons, I think that's, that's what it means. How you, how you run a company as an integrated whole rather than, you know, separate, uh, you know, disparate units. Yeah. Yeah. And it's mm. about getting that balance like nature gives us yes. the balance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think for me, being in nature makes me feel closer to, to God, to my creator. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe on a hike in the uh, Himalayas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, listen, if you, if you spend a amount of time, I think, like I've done in nature, I think it's, it's, very, it's, it's difficult to deny mm -hmm. the existence of some creative force yeah. okay, maintaining this order. Okay, I think it was Alexander Pope who said, heaven, the order is heaven's first law. Yeah. And that order that you see in nature, somebody is planning it, something is planning it. Um, I myself, okay, um, in terms of religion, don't like to confine myself to any particular religion. So I have my own conception of what, uh, you know, the divine is, okay. But... If you ask, did I have any, any experience? I think every time I go into nature, I experience that. You know, I've yeah. been fortunate to see a, a rhino calf being born, a baby oh. giraffe being born, a protea blooming in, you know, somewhere. So every time you see that, you know, there is that, that you, you know that there's a connection, you know, with, uh, with something far greater than, than what you are. But I did have one experience, I think, if I had to, um, Call. I was in India, uh, and uh, in South India, there's a mountain there called Arunachal, and I decided to hike this mountain, uh, which was rather foolish because it was quite hot that day. And um, so, you know, I, as I was walking up there, it became terribly hot, and I started becoming dehydrated. And but anyway, I managed to get to the top. And when I got to the top, you know, I sat on a rock. And below me was this green lush valley. Yeah. And then there was breeze coming up from the valley, a very, very cool breeze that was coming up, blowing against my face and against my ears. And there was a vibration that I could feel. And, you know, it may sound corny, but to me at that moment, it felt like the vibration of the universe. Mm. It was as if I was one with the universe. I felt a sense of peace and a sense of contentment that I had never, ever experienced before, okay? What it was, I don't know, okay? Uh, I don't want to think too much about it, but I know I've never, ever felt that sense of peace that I felt on that mountaintop on yeah. that day. Um, and, you know, even years later, when I, you know, I think when I'm in any kind of stress or worry or whatever, I tried to cast my mind back to that. That I place. I yes. remember that feeling. I remember that feeling, what it was like. And it, you know, it does help. So that I think was the closest that I've ever come to having that sort of uh, you know, deep spiritual experience. Uh, mm. Wow. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, what I was just thinking, like, we have busy lives, we have many roles to play, but what are some of the things that we could do daily to kind of start looking after our earth and start making a difference and, and be, sort of to just be a, you know, like a good custodian of this earth that we are on? Yeah, you know, um, Nishani, we, we spoke about nature deficit disorder. Yeah. I think there's another thing called nature knowledge uh, deficit yeah. in the sense that there's a deficit, I think, in our knowledge. Now, I mean, when we began, you asked me to define biodiversity, right? Yes. Um, sometimes I use words because those are words we use all the time in the profession that I was. We sometimes think that every, we think everybody understands. But I find when we, think, when we talk about global warming, when we talk about um, greenhouse gases, when we talk about climate change, people have heard about these things. But I don't know how much people actually really know about it yeah. and what causes it, what, is, what does it mean, okay? Yeah. And I think that 
we need to educate ourselves, okay? Uh, what is global warming? What causes global warming? Why is it important that we worry about it? You know, why is it important that we do all the things to try to reduce global warming? Yeah. Okay. So, so that, you know, you, you begin to appreciate, you know, um, and, and, and I call it environmental literacy, basically, that there are certain words and certain concepts and terms we need to understand. So I think if we, we should make an effort to try to understand, you know, those. And one of the, the benefits, I think, of connecting and reconnecting with nature, okay, is that if you start to understand the benefits, the personal benefits of nature to you, as, as, okay, yeah. then you begin to appreciate the value of nature. And when you appreciate the value of something, then you will do everything you can to protect it. Yeah. Okay. So I think the protection of the environment starts with an appreciation of, of what the environment means to you, you know? So, so what you can, I mean, there are various things we could do, okay? The first thing I would say, you know, spend less time in the malls. Spend less really, time at you know, the malls. Okay. Spend less time, really, right. You know, it's, it's very convenient over the weekend for a That's family to go and, you know, so yeah. It's, it's very convenient, you know, to go to the mall and because you can get entertained, you can do all kinds of things. But, you know, just, just go out into, into nature, right? Just, I mean, there are so many places in and around the cities. Okay? Durban's got Durban Botanic Gardens. It's free. Okay? There is our one forest in, in, uh, in Anshlanga, which is at, uh, through, the, through the coastal bush and onto the peat. I mean, yeah. it's free. Right. Yeah. That, that is free. So, you, you know, there's so many things you could do. Okay, so spend less time in the mall space and try to spend more time outdoors. Okay, with children, I said, Go play outdoors, okay. go and play outdoors, you know, pull your shoes off, feel the grass, climb the trees, do things like that. And the other thing is that <clears throat> I think if you develop an interest in the outdoors in some activity, a simple thing like bird watching, yes. okay, now you know. Um, if you go out into the garden, you can see a variety of birds. Okay, most of us don't even know. Besides, maybe one or two common birds. The rest we don't we don't know. Okay, but it's not difficult. Then, if you go to a second-hand bookshop, you can pick up a bird book for twenty rand. You know, and you bring that home, right? And if you see a bird, just try to identify it, right? And when you then it may develop into a into a hobby you know uh, and i know a lot of people started off just you know identifying one or two birds and got so into it now become now uh, passionate bird, bird watchers okay um, or simple thing like hiking yes cost nothing basically you know and a lot of places you can go hiking in relatively safe places in south africa so and we we're so fortunate in this country to have good weather to have good natural areas for us to do these things okay yes. Um, or, 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 or fishing or canoeing or something like that. That if you start developing an interest, uh, you know, a hobby in, in, in some outdoor pursuit, okay, then it, going outdoor becomes a pleasure, you understand? It becomes it's even a family uh, thing that people can, you could do as a family. Yeah. So, so those are things we need to do, okay? We need to start developing interests, I think, you know, in some of the, the activities uh, that we can do in nature, okay. Um, and the other thing that, uh, that we did while I was in Sinzi uh, to encourage people to, to get back to nature, we did a challenge, we called it 30 and 30, okay. Mm -hmm. It was in April, I remember. 30 and 30 meant that for 30 days, okay, you've got to commit, right, to spend mm -hmm. time in nature. Now, we know that changing beliefs and habits are just very, very difficult to do. Yeah. So what we said is this, okay, on the first day, first of April, go outside and spend one minute in nature. That could mean you walk outside, pull your shoes off and, 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 and feel the grass, you know, just yeah. feel the grass for one minute, okay, and come back. Then the next day, which is the second, go, now spend two minutes, okay, go outside, look at a flower and just look at it carefully for two minutes and come back. And then the third day, spend three minutes, right? Uh, but when we say nature, it could be anything, you know, it could be a pot plant, it could be looking up at the sky, look at the clouds, you know, look at yeah. the stars, uh, right? Or look at trees. So each day, 
Okay, and then we gave them people a calendar, you know, bank calendar, yes. and you, you put a cross for each day that you did it. So when it comes to the 30th day, you spend 30 minutes yes. in nature, okay, hoping that in that period, in that whole period of that month, you, you begin to see the value, okay? And then we also gave people a journal so that they would record, you know, what uh, they, they felt, what they saw, you know, um, and just as and people then posted some of those, those journals and some of the things that, you know, they, they did onto our, you know, social media pages and things like that. Uh, you know, I did that with my staff and, 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 and we found that people were writing poetry that they didn't even know that they could write, you know, uh, people were drawing, uh, yes. you know, but just because they were given that opportunity and spend the time yeah. to do it. So that was uh, something you know, that, that we did that was quite successful and, and maybe people should try that, you know. You've got to make a conscious effort. It just doesn't happen. You know, you've got to tell yourself, listen, yeah, you know, we're going to do this you know, every day and then, then you build slowly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's about the, creating the awareness and creating the consciousness, but also sort of trying to change habits in our daily lives. Mm. That allow us the space and time to to be in nature. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, are you sort of a, an advocate of, of recycling and all those kind of things? Are we, are you saying, you know? Yeah, I mean, th th those are obvious stuff that you know people could could do. You know, I mean, um, at at home recycling. Also about energy. You know, the way we use um, you know renewable energy. Um, all, all those things there um, are, are things we could do, you know, we could do, and we could teach our children, you know, to those things. I think in South Africa, we're lagging quite a bit behind the rest of the world, especially when it comes to recycling. You know, um, we don't recycle, I think, as much as, as, as other countries. Yeah. But I think we are getting there, and I think we need to do that. But, uh, yeah, there are so many things. I mean, even in the office, I mean, the way we paper, you know, all, all those types. Yeah, it's, it's just such an interesting observation because I was thinking the other day, I had to print something um, mm -hmm. yesterday, actually. And I thought, my goodness, I wonder when was the last time I printed something, you know? Yeah. So whereas if I was in the office, my, my thought to print was, was quite, you know, it, it's almost unconscious. You just hit, hit print. But because I'm um, printing in my own home with my own yeah. ink, yeah. I am yeah. far more conscious of the cost impact and you know things like that, and so therefore haven't been printing, you know, yeah. Yeah, and things like plastic as well, you know that you know when you when you're going shopping, the plastic bags, you know all those things. I mean, those are little things we we could we could all do, uh, mm. you know, paper bag, plastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you watched the Octopus Teacher, uh, Ray, yet? Oh, oh. <laughs> it's about the kelp yeah. forest in the Cape and, and uh, a man's yeah. journey through a year. Beautiful, beautiful uh, movie, nature movie. On Netflix, guys, if you want to watch that. So, Ray, you know, one of the things that we do at Seeds of Hope, and this is my little bag of goodies, is that we provide sanitary wave to girls who are in dire need of recy it's recyclable, it's environmentally friendly, and after five years of using it, it actually just completely disintegrates into the earth. And um, one of the things that we find is the, the amount of sanitary wear that, that ends up in, in heaps on piles, with, you know, um, which is not really great for the environment. Mm. So one of the things that we are doing is we are providing this for women and girls who, who don't have access to sanitary wear and who have this, um, you know, what, I spent some time in, in the Eastern Cape and, it was really sad to see how the, the impact of not having um, access to feminine hygiene impacted education, impacted violence against women, and it's something very dear to our hearts. So if you want to get involved and if you want to um, be a part of this, please go and like the Facebook page Seeds of Hope and send us a message there um, you know, to, to become a part of the, the solution as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Great initiative. <laughs> Ray, before you go, what is mm -hmm. your message of hope um, that you'd like to, to leave us with tonight? Um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, when, when we look at um, you know, the, the environmental crisis that, that, that facing the world, um, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom about it, and yeah. rightly so. But I'm also encouraged uh, that, you know, in my time in conservation, I've had the privilege of meeting, working with some men and women incredible, who are doing incredible work, yeah. you know, in conservation education um, so you know I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that there are individuals in the world that are you know um, forefront of, um, of, <clears throat> of making of raising awareness of, of doing something about it so from that point of view I think you know there, there, there is hope I think I also am encouraged by I think the younger people I think young people um, you know are beginning to you know, become more aware of yeah. uh, of the uh, crisis that we're facing, and let's not you know um, diminish this here that it is a crisis. And you know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, you know, this year we faced a crisis, we yeah. faced COVID, okay, but the world responded very very quickly. We changed our lifestyle. It's yeah. so much, you know, in so many ways to address this year. This is because it was in our face, you know, it, we could see it, we could see people uh, getting sick, we could see people dying. Yeah. Especially with the environmental crisis, it's not in your face, you don't see it every day. It's more insidious in its, you know, in its effects. Okay? Uh, we don't see the polar ice caps melting, you understand? It takes a long time, but slowly and slowly over time you see it. Yeah. But it is a crisis, and you know, nonetheless. And uh, and the thing is that this is the only Earth we have. You understand? We we basically destroy the environment. We're destroying, you know, our life. Basically, we've got nowhere else to go. I know people are talking about populating Mars and all those things, yeah, but that's that's a pipe dream. We are, we this is the only planet we have. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm I'm encouraged, you know, to see young people. Uh, I think uh, becoming in this and uh, the other thing I think that, that also, uh, as I spoke about earlier, you know, the, that America coming back and, and and some of the environmental legislation that they are, that, that Biden is going to be, you know, passing. So, so that also, you know, sort of puts me. In this field. I think you know, as a human race, we face a lot of tragedies in, in throughout the, the history, of, and, and people, you always had people somewhere, somehow, come up with the solutions, I think, you know, uh, to uh, take us past it. Yeah. So I think I'm encouraged that although the problem is serious, you know, I think um, there are, you know, people and there are measures, you know, that we, we can take to at least, uh, you know, uh, bring the Sorry, I missed that last part that you said. Oh, sorry, I think there are measures and there are people that we, you know, they're there to bring it under control. Yeah, yeah. That is hopeful. That is hopeful. And it doesn't, I suppose it doesn't um, excuse us from each doing our part as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you see, um, you know, governments can sign agreements and accords and everything. But governments, I mean, it's the people that have to do the actual work. You know, you yes. Understand? Uh, we, the, we, it's at the individual level that the difference is made. You know, governments are there to sign the treaties, but it's the individuals who have to actually make it happen. Yeah, yeah, mm. that is so true. That is so true. Ray, you say anything else that you would like to add tonight? Um, no, I'm. I think you asked quite a number of uh, of questions. Um, I just no, I just want to, um, um, you know, just encourage people you know um you just go and play outside you know that, that's what i'm saying play outside you know yeah. why why be stuck indoors you know yeah. uh, go and experience nature yeah. you know um at jim Sinzi we had a we had a, a campaign we called it eden uh well it's a eden. Mystery, it was the metaphor eden yeah i mean yeah. it had the metaphoric uh, association with the garden you know going back to uh, you know time when you know of, of paradise but it was actually an acronym for educate and draw people to experience nature. And that yeah. was what we 
educate and draw people to experience it. And that's basically been my, my mission. And that is something I think that I still, you know, will, will pursue, I think, till, till the last <laughs> you know, breath in my body. You know, I mean, that, 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 that's what I will, will, will continue to do. Or I can tell is just go outside and experience nature. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Go outside and experience nature. And, you know, uh, play in the dirt, really, just play in the dirt. You know, one of the things I've started to do during this lockdown is um, container, container growing because I have very boisterous uh, dogs, so fur, fur family. And uh, it's difficult to grow veggies. But once I put them in the container, they were able to, to grow. So I've started growing my own veggies. And I must think I must have a blanket on that grass for the last 10 years. Um, you know, living in Joburg and living in suburbia, uh, being mm. landlocked, it's quite difficult. But, you know, if you find your one space, your one thing, your ritual that keeps you connected to the earth, lying on the grass, staring up at the clouds, um, taking the time to smell the roses, it's not actually just a phrase. It does make a difference. Make a yeah, and, and, and as in South Africa, we are spoiled for choice. We are. Uh, um, yeah, there, there, there's so much, uh, you know, natural areas, you know. Yeah. That, that, and, and our parks are well run, you know. I mean, some of the, the, the parks are really well run parks. Uh, and uh, yeah. we have some very nice parks. And what, what, a, what a diversity of habitats as well, you know, that, yeah. that, that we can enjoy. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for sharing your insight and your experience. It's been wonderful having you join us this evening. Thanks. Thanks, Nachani. Thanks for inviting me, um, you know, and, uh, and, and really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Okay. All right. It's such a pleasure. And face okay. family, we'd like to say thank you so much. Thank you for you know, spending some time with us for listening. Please leave your comments and your questions below. Uh, we will get back to you. And um, remember to like the uh, Seeds of Hope page and the YouTube channel that's going to be launching tomorrow. Um, and I'd like to say, you know, may God bless you. May God make his face to shine upon you. And may hope always light your way. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Ms. Bye. Bye-bye.